First of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. What I've been wanting to do is work on a Barber Biz podcast. So what we want to talk about is the business of barbering. I know that you've been in this for a long time. And so there's just a few questions and things that I want to talk to you about. And I know you wrote a book on barbering and I've seen you at hair shows constantly, always with a booth, always there with your own products. And I've also seen the younger generation coming in and I don't see them as often with as much longevity. They show up, they're in the mix for a moment and then they disappear. But meanwhile, like Ivan was there, is there, and I assume he'll continue to be there. And the grays come in a little bit, but for the most part, I still see you there. Just a little grayer each time. Do you dye your hair at all? Or no, you're just like embracing no, it. No, back in the day when I used to sell hair color, specifically highlighting, yeah. I had highlighting in through the top because if you're going to be a seller, you got to be a buyer. But no, I'm not covering yeah. I'm getting a haircut tomorrow. My youngest son gets married next week and I got to get a haircut for the wedding. So I got an appointment with a buddy in the business. That's a little road trip to go see him to get hooked up nicely for the weekend. And we'll take that gray down nice and short. It'll blend into my skin tone. You won't know it's there. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's great. All right. So tell me, how long have you been cutting hair just in general? I got 35 years as of 2023. I've held every job there is to hold in the business. I started out in cosmetology school, went to barber school later. My first job was shampoo girl, sweeping other people's floors and folding other people's towels and all that. I've owned my own shop. I've traveled all over the world as an educator, worked for a major brand as their director of education, went off on my own about 12 years ago. I've written 14 different books related to making money in the beauty and barber business. You referenced, I sell those books at shows and events. I've got a handful of patents on tools, some that are sold by other companies that have been licensed, others that are patents that I market the products myself, but got a lot going on. If it continues to be a great business, then there's so many great ways to make money. Absolutely. And here's the thing. The reason why I specifically wanted to speak with you is because what I've seen over time, there's a lot of flash in the pan things that happen where, man, this guy's super popular and everybody wants to see him and everybody wants him at every hair show. And then after a few years, they disappear. And so what's interesting about your situation is that you stayed in it for a long time. So one of my questions was, first of all, are you still working in the barbershop today? I stopped cutting hair in a shop right as we locked down for COVID. And I have not gone back to a shop yet. I keep saying that I want to go back and part time and get into a shop. And I had a lot of fun cutting hair. I enjoy cutting hair. I worked in a shop with a guy who was a big European soccer fan. And when it's a beautiful day, the doors open, the wind's blowing gently. You got a soccer game on TV. You got a waiting room full of people. You're hanging out, cutting hair. You're making money. I don't know that there are a lot of better jobs out there. It's a hard job, though. It's hard being, being a barber, being up on your feet all day, cutting hair, trying to be accurate. What keeps you going? There are some physical demands. There are some what we'll call business demand. And I try to help people understand what their responsibilities and obligations are as a business person, first and foremost to themselves, secondarily to their, their employer, or in the case of chair rent, a landlord, and then of course, to their client. It can be physically demanding. It can be a stressful job. If you are, if you don't have reduction in a row, there's so much that you can do as a professional barber to make things easier for yourself. Well, the haircuts are easy. Doing haircuts is easy. We learn how to do haircuts. We know how to do haircuts. That's the easy, quite frankly, the fun part. A lot of guys where they fall down or where they get in trouble is they don't want to do the work to do the other stuff. And what are some of the other stuff that you're talking and about? And that's what I'll start with something you started when we first got online here. Be on time. I said this the other day in a comment on a post online. And I feel very strongly about this. And I think a lot of guys don't understand how serious an issue this is. Very simply, if you cannot run on time, be a walk-in barber. If you can't run on time, be a walk-in guy. Because an appointment is a promise. An appointment is an obligation. An appointment is a commitment. And if you cannot honor your commitment, don't be, don't make it. So 
you know, you can't walk up to somebody in the waiting room and go, yo, buddy, you're my 11. I'm about six minutes behind. I'll be right with you. Have a seat. I'll be right there. That's just not okay. A, an 11 o'clock appointment should be able to be butt down in your chair at 10, 59, and 59 seconds with zero exceptions to this. So you've got to, you run your day, you structure your day, you plan your day. You got to learn how to say no to people. Guy comes in, books a haircut, doesn't book a beard trim. You only have a haircut spot. Say no to the beard trim. Guy doesn't have a haircut, walks in for a haircut. Say no to the walk-in if you're 10 minutes away from an appointment. If you can't do that haircut in nine and a half minutes, you must say no. Because what you're saying to a client is, you're saying to a client, you made an appointment, I made a promise, I made a commitment, but I didn't take it seriously. And that's an example where it's hard to do. It's so basic and fundamental. And when you make the commitment to honor that, chisel it in stone. I'm not kidding when I tell you, I've been in the business 35 years. I've taken appointments for most of that career. I have never once ever in 35 years been late. And it's so basic. I love this because I've had this conversation several times with different people to talk about the difference between having an online scheduling system, having a person book but not pay, having a person book and put down a deposit, having a person book, not pay, put their card on file, and then charge them a no-show fee and have these different ways of doing business. And most of the time when you're having this conversation, you're having it from the position of the barber's talking about the customer's responsibility and what the customer needs to do. And they need to put down money and they need to be on time and they need to be the, and I love your take on it is, wait a minute, we can't really control the, the customer. What we can do is control the barber's decision to be there and be on time. And so I guess in, in that context. Now let me interrupt you and say this. The last couple of years with the success of the online appointment booking apps and the ability to take credit card deposits and to charge people late fees, Online social media has lit up with these barbers losing their minds over no call, no show. Mm -hmm. And I want to, you're right. I want to turn it around. I want to say, hang on a minute. You signed up to be a part of a business and an industry in which you have dedicated your life to the service of others. How dare mm -hmm. you get upset with a late client? Unless, Who's the first one to throw stones? I don't want to get biblical on you, but it's, dude, if you have not run on time with no exceptions, this is hard and fast. If you do not run on time all the time, every time, you are essentially sending a message to your customers that it is okay That's to right. be late. You have given permission to customers to be late and to blow you off. And the That's other it. piece of this is no call, no show. Somebody that doesn't show up for an appointment if your business, your life, your finances are in such a situation where a single no call, no show blows up your day, blows up your week or blows up your month, so much of your business is completely yeah. out of whack. You're not charging enough. You're not busy enough. You're not serving enough because quite frankly, the way I put it with people is a no call, no show for a barber should be viewed as a gift from heaven and making enough money that a no-call, no-show means you go to the bathroom. You get to grab a Diet Coke. You get to pick up your phone and text your mother. You get to check on your kids. You get to relax, catch your breath, go outside mm. in front of the shop and get a breath of fresh air. A no-call, no-show should not be something that you're screaming and yelling about you should kind of a little bit be praying for a no-call, no-show every now wow. and then. And so if you had those options, allow a customer to book and not put anything down, allow a customer to book, put their card down, but not have to pay, or allow a customer to book and pay a deposit or the price of the haircut. Out of those three options, what would you encourage a barber to do? I would encourage them to use some form of online booking right. software. I would encourage them, do not take a card, do not take a deposit, do not ask for any form of money mm. up front, especially for a first-time client. Now, once the client knows you 
and as a repeat customer, I understand that there can be some convenience of having their card on file. So with Uber, click, right. we're done. And there's no need to talk about it. There's it's quick, it's fast, it's easy. That at that point, it has become a convenience wow. to the customer. Remember, customer service. <laughs> you're the but complete when we're talking you're about, complete opposite, you know, though. The people say the op the entire opposite thing. When it's a new client and I don't know them, they gotta put down money. This way I know they don't get me. No, no way. Here's the thing. The problem is today, too many people in our business have got the whole business backwards. Somehow, some way, at some point, they watched some video where some guy talked about being a celebrity barber and they made the mistake of thinking that the barber was the celebrity. Mm. And it's 100% ass backwards. Mm. The barber is serving the customer. People ask me all the time, Ivan, do you cut celebrities? And my answer has always been, that depends on what you celebrate. Because in my house, anybody whose credit card clears the machine <laughs> the is a celebrity. celebrity. That's good, yeah. Because that's what I'm celebrating. Listen to the word, okay? It's not, it's never been, we've got these guys with their ego just completely out of whack here. My answer would be, only because if I don't know you, I've right. never met you. Somebody referred me to you. It's time to get a haircut. I'm not giving you my credit card information. Right. Our business is based on trust. I'm going to come in. I'm going to sit down. You're going to cut my hair and I'm going to pay you. That's the unspoken agreement we've had in this industry yep. since the beginning of time. Nothing is going to change. Now, if I like you, I like the haircut. I like the chop. I like the environment. I like the location. I like everything about it. And I'm coming back. Yep. If it is convenient for me to give you a card so I can expedite the transaction, mm, I can mm. make it easy. You can right. you, my second haircut, I would probably do right, that. Right. But if you ask me to do that before I even set mm -hmm. foot in your business, think about tell me what other business. If you ever you want to buy a car and you call the Ford dealer and you say, I want to come in, I want to come in and take a look at an F-150. I'm thinking about buying one. And the salesman says, that's great. Why don't you come in about two o'clock today? Give me your credit card. Right. It's a free drive. Free yeah, test drive. It's just yeah. not going to happen. Yeah, it's not going it, to happen. It, it, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to ask you for your credit card information. You want to go to buy anything. Why do we think it? When did we get so arrogant, conceited, and full of ourselves to think that this is all about what's good for me? And the, so, yeah, and that's where, that really? was mainly where I want to. And so when you did online booking, Wait, so for because you're going to have two different subjects. You're in the business 35 years. What do you say to a guy that's coming out of Barber's College? They've just gotten out of, they got their license. They've been talking to this guy down the street who got it, and they've just gotten their first opportunity. How do you encourage them to go about, everybody's talking about online booking. Everybody's talking about no-show fees. What would you say to that younger barber? Because I think it makes a lot of sense when someone's more seasoned, but what about that younger barber? They've been out of school for two weeks. They're in the shop for the first time. Should they even be thinking about online booking or trying to build a book that way? Or what are some other ways they should be thinking at, at that point? When you graduate from bar cosmetology or barber school, your first job, not your last job and not your only job, but your first job out of school should be at a low price, high volume, family oriented, multi-unit chain oh. salon. Go get a job at Zippy Cuts and Quickie Cuts and Kitty Cuts and Mappy Cuts and Crappy Cuts, whatever brand they have in your neighborhood. Because at that chain salon, you're going to get two things mm. that you need right now. The two things you're going to get, number one, you're going to get training. Mm. You think school is the end. When you're done with school, you're done. No, when you're done with school, it's a mm. beginning. And you need to set in motion the idea of continuing education and ongoing training. So number one at a chain shop, you're going to get training. Number two at a chain shop, you're going to get heads. They're going to put heads in your chair. They're going to put heads in the waiting room. You're in three months time, you're going to cut three years worth wow. of hair. You get out of school, you go down the street, you rent a chair at Jim's barber shop. You're going to sit in your chair unless you've got a massive amount of hustle and you're willing to work 12 hours a day pounding the street to fill that chair. People aren't just going to magically show up. So I tell people three months in a chain shop, then you got to find the right place where you're a good fit, where you've got a mentor, you've got an mm. owner, a team member, a coworker. 
who knows what you want to know, who has what you want to have, who does what you want to do, who is where you want to be. And you want to stand one and a half feet behind this guy's right shoulder. Anytime you don't have a client in your chair, you want to be standing there like a golden retriever right behind him. Go listening and looking and watching. Wow. Don't even worry about an appointment booking app. Initially, worry right. about walk-ins and worry about your own traffic. Get a box of 500 business cards. Take the 500 business yes. card challenge. Get my book, 100 by 100, 100 new haircut customers in 100 days. Most importantly in this, the message, the overarching message of all of this is as a new professional barber, you must take responsibility for your success. Don't expect the house to give you clients. Don't expect the box to give you clients. Don't expect walk-ins to show up. It'll be a miracle. It'll be a blessing. You, that's how you build it. I hear it all the time. All the time, I guys coming out of barber school going, I'm going to own my own shop in a year or so, and it's not fair. This owner's not bringing me any new customers. Maybe I need to do a booking system. Maybe it's maybe the problem is I'm using this system. I should be using Booksy. I should be using these other things. And you get the total opposite. And I think you get the same thing with apprenticeship and barber school. You have the same concept where there. I need it, but if I'm an apprentice, I don't learn theory. What would you say to someone who is, as far as apprenticeship versus barber schools, which option do you think better? Or essentially, what Tyree Jackson, you're saying when you become a barber, you need to be an advocate for your business. And he's saying when you're a student, you need to be an advocate for your education. And I think there's a misstep there. So what would you encourage? But this is now before they even go into school, they're wondering if they should. Does it matter if they do apprenticeship or barber school? Which one do you think is a better option for them? I think they both have great value. I'm a big fan and advocate for barber schools. There are lots of good barber schools. I think a barber school should include, a period of time in barber school should include, if it's a thousand hours in barber school, there should be 300 hours that are in a shop on the street in an apprenticeship mm. as a part of that, where I live in the state of Illinois, we have a blended hybrid right. like that. But, and I'm going to say this, and, and I'm very serious when I say this, barber school doesn't make you a barber. An apprenticeship doesn't make you a barber. You get a license. A license is a ticket to the game, okay? It's like a buying a ticket to any other game. When you buy a ticket to an NBA game, you're getting admission to the building. There's no promise that your team's going to win. There's no promise that you're going to see a three-pointer from the midcourt. There's no promise of what's going to unfold during that game. You just got a ticket to the game. Your barber license is a ticket to the game. You're responsible for your own future, your own education. It's what you make of it. And you're responsible for filling your chair. You're responsible for understanding how the business works by learning from the people that know. And that's where these mentorships and barber school instructors can be very good mentors. Employers can be very good mentors. Co-workers can be very good mentors. And you know what? You also need mentors in the form of people like your grandpa and your uncle Bob or the old man that lived two doors down that has an entire, that's got a 70 year career working on a railroad that doesn't know anything about barbering, but knows quite a bit about life. Mm. Because I will say this, and I know this gets people upset when I say it sometimes, but I need to say it a lot because people don't understand it. Haircuts don't matter. Haircuts don't matter. We're not, if you got into this business because you thought this was the business of cutting hair, you're in the wrong business. This is the business of building and maintaining relationships with humans. We go to hair shows and we see guys walking with a bag filled with the latest clipper. You don't need another clipper. You don't need to do a blurrier fade. The clients don't know the difference and they don't care. You need to know how to put butts in seats and you need to know how to get those people to come back. And the haircut is not what's going to bring them back. It is the experience. It is Everything from, do you run on time? Do you throw neck strips on the floor? Do you offer me my next appointment? Do you offer me proper home care items? Do you talk on your phone while you're cutting my hair? Do you have wing sauce on your cargo shorts? 
Does your station look clean? Are you using a sharp bin or an empty water bottle for razor wow. blades? These are the things that matter. Haircuts don't matter. I can teach anyone. I can teach a 10-year-old kid how to do a decent fade. A long time. And you've made this shift from being a barber to being an educator. And what we're seeing now is people with a lot of popularity become educators right away. And what would you say, when do you think a person is ready to go f take that leap? Because we talked about the beginning stages of being a barber. And in a lot of ways, it's so funny because I'm talking to you, you're saying a lot of opposites of what a lot of people say, which is it's it, the problem is your clippers. The problem is your booking system. The problem is you got to be on this and you're coming from a different angle. So I would no. love to... Yes, problem. exactly. Take You're responsibility for your education and for your barbering career. And so I guess just to... All right, here, here's yeah. what I'll tell you. Here's what I'll tell you. When it comes to educators, when it comes to being an educator... When do you educator, know you're, it's, you're ready to take that leap and become an educator? Well, here's what a couple things I'll tell you. Number one, if you want to do better haircuts, one of the most important things you can do is delete your Instagram account. There is so much bad education on Instagram from people who don't know what they're doing and how to do it. I can, I don't even want to begin to tell you about all the things I see on a daily basis going on from educators and demonstrators who have just horrible mm. skills and are who are offering bad advice. But here's what I'll tell you about being an educator. I love Tyreek yeah. and I love Kenny mm. Duncan and I love Los mm -hmm. Cut It and I love G Wiz from Wall. And we've got so many great people. Bird, I love so many of these guys that are getting up there, A-Rod, that are getting up there and leading and inspiring and sharing in our business. But here's the deal. We don't need another Tyreek Jackson. We got a good one. We don't need another Kenny Duncan. We got a good one. We don't need another A-Rod. We don't need another Ivan Zoot. So my message to those people that think they want to educate is what are you bringing that is to the conversation that is new? What are you, what are you bringing that we haven't seen and we haven't heard and that we need to know? Because here's the deal. If you've got something new to share, don't wait. Don't try to get a job with a brand. Don't wait to be chosen or anointed or appointed or selected or gifted or black because the line is too long and it's never going to happen. If you want to share, you got a phone, get a YouTube, get a Twitter, get a podcast, get a TikTok and start sharing because here's the thing. The beautiful thing about social media is it's extraordinarily effective at figuring out what's good and what's crap. So here's the deal. If you're good, we're going to find you and the world will find you and discover you. If you don't have something new to share, don't wait. Step up. Step up to the microphone. Step up to the camera and share it. Because if it's good, we're going to find you. And then people will offer you jobs and opportunities. If you suck, don't worry about that either. Because no one will ever see it. It will die on the web. And it'll right. be gone and you've got nothing to yeah, Absolutely. I recently, I took a trip to a city. I wouldn't say, I won't say the name of it, but I went, we went into a few barbershops and I seen a group, most of them with just bad technique. And you can almost tell, yeah, they're on Instagram is almost creating a generation of bad hair cutters. And they are all doing something similar. They all take an hour and 15 minutes to do a basic haircut and they all charge a lot of money. And it's shifting what the culture is when barbering. What you're talking about is the complete opposite of that. Go in there, do fast, get better over time. And I see the opposite. I see young guys, 19 years old, putting a ball line right and cut, working for an hour and a half to try to get that line out. And then eventually they come out with a good haircut. But it's that they're getting that education off of Instagram that they're just constantly set that way. So I, and, and I've been telling people for years. Yeah. If you don't put the line in, you don't got to take the line out. Stop with the freaking line. And you, you, you use that as an example, right? It's a perfectly good one. When you head and they got those lines drawn yeah, on yeah. the head where they superimposed the graphics and it said two guard, one and a half, one blade open. That's just crap. 
we don't cut hair that way. That's not how you cut hair. But those are examples of the kinds of education, the kinds of examples these people are consuming on a daily basis. And they're taking that to the street. And to your point, they want to charge a hundred. Okay, God bless you. You want to charge a hundred. I think you should charge a hundred. But they're spending an hour on a haircut for a hundred bucks. The client's yeah. pissed off. The client can't doesn't have that kind of time. I'm not proud. I'm not too proud to tell you. Up until COVID, when I left my job, COVID, I was doing $20 haircuts. I was doing six of them per hour in a busy wow. barber shop. And I was making a ton of money and taking good care of people. And I was banging out haircuts that were perfectly good. They were absolutely okay. Were they the best haircut in the Chicago metropolitan area? Right. No way. But did they need to be? No way. Did anybody care? No, no way. No. If I'm with you. And do the mayor. I was no, working, I'm, I, I'm working two days wow. a week, eight hours wow. a day, six haircuts an hour. That's 48 haircuts a day, two days a week. That's 96 haircuts a week at $20 a haircut. You can figure out how much money mm -hmm. I was making. Yeah, no, that's what's incredible because that's why I mentioned earlier, I still see you at, I only started in this industry around 2015. I saw you in 2015, it's 20, 2023, and I've seen a lot of people come and go, and then I've seen you, you're still there with the booth. Why, let me ask you a question, with that being said, why is it that you continue to go to hair shows and conventions, get a booth, educate, why do you con continue to do this when you'll see other people come and go, a flash and a, but I'm assuming you've been there before 2015, and you're still here today, why do you continue to go? I've been here since 1988 and I'm there because I'm a moving target. I'm always writing another book. I'm always introducing another product. I've got something new to share. I've been innovative in the business. The show book me for classes because people come to my mm. class. They, I, mean, I have a booth on the floor because people come to my booth. You, you know, and I'm not bragging, right, I'm right. not showing off, but you go to a booth and you look down the aisle and you look at how many people are at a booth mm -hmm. and how much money they're yeah. spending. I'm running yeah. a business. I'm running a business. My business is providing coaching, consulting, products, books, and education to help people in the beauty business build and grow their business. I'm fortunate. I've got great sponsors. I've worked with some fabulous brands over the years. And the, they want to work with me because they know I am going to deliver their message. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that thing is incredible that you're still around when I saw him. Man, this guy, he just, he just doesn't quit. I, I think it's him. Yeah, I guess that this has been, I don't have to lead you much. You do your own. All I got to do is throw a piece of meat on the floor. You just tear it up. So I love this interview. That's this right. is one of the best interviews I've ever done. Let me just a bit about, take a step back, lessons that you learned by going through COVID, especially as a barber, now you're on the, because COVID really stopped this year. Technically, the federal government decided this year that COVID was over, even though it's been over since last year, but we're now in a post-COVID world. What did COVID teach you learn from the worldwide pandemic? And now that we're on the other side of it, what do you take from that with you in the future? What do you want people to know about that? I think we learned a lot of lessons coming out of COVID. I made predictions at the beginning, and you're right. When did it end? There's the way the government right. tracks it. There's the way we treat it in the shop and things like that. Those lines are fuzzy. We're certainly in a post-COVID-19 yes. marketplace at this point in time. But COVID had a lot of upsides. Now, I realize if you lost yeah. your grandma or you lost your business, COVID was tough. And a lot of people were hurt in a lot of ways by so many aspects of what the pandemic was all about. The flip side of that is, like any other experience, there's an upside. And I think as far as COVID upsides are concerned, one of the things, you know, which is a pet project of mine, is the subject of haircut pricing. July 1 is Raise Your Haircut Prices Day in the USA. We have our national professional haircutting holiday coming up in less than two weeks. And never before in all the years that I've been talking about pricing, I've written a book about pricing, there's better understanding about the role of our pricing and our timing and the experience we deliver, the whole relationship. We've seen COVID brought about an increase in sweet rental, which was a trend that was right. already well on its way pre-COVID, 
but there were a lot of reasons why during COVID suites were hot. Now coming out of COVID, there's a lot of reasons why people are looking at that business model and going, I like this. This works for me. This works for us. The flip side of that is we've also learned that if during COVID, waiting rooms without community, without social and without gathering places, there was something really missing when they took that away from us. And people crave that environment, mm. that contact, that interaction, and that aspect of the barber stylist customer, customer to customer even relationship. Mm. So I think we we the biggest takeaways from COVID is we've learned to value each other and ourselves in very positive ways. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you're saying because you're saying COVID was hard for a lot of people. Yes, and they may have gone through it very difficult. But look at it. I love this one saying, this guy says, when there's a big tsunami, most people are running away from it. Some people grab their surfboards and they head towards it. How, to be honest, if I do, I don't know Ivan Zoo. I don't know, you know, where he rests his head. I don't know, you know, how many children he has. I don't know anything about that. It seems to me like, man, you've been hitting on all cylinders. You're batting a thousand. Can you tell me about some of the hard times went through and a few things that you've had to come uh, overcome throughout your time? Because it seems like, hey, you do a perfect haircut. You you do nine cuts in days. You're selling product. You go to shows. Everything's perfect. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the hardships that you've experienced being a barber over the past since 1988 and that you've overcome? My short answer is no, I can't tell you any of those things because I am running my public life right. like Instagram. I am curating it. I am showing you what I want mm -hmm. you to see. I'm not showing you that I'm losing my mind that I'm in a panic because I got a shipment of combs coming late from China. I'm not showing you that my book is late because I'm waiting on my editor because I don't know how to spell my own name and I don't know how to punctuate and I have to have a third party do those things for sure. me because I'm somewhat disabled yeah. in that regard. I'm not sh walking out the house with a handful of business cards and not coming home with any business cards because I'm out there pounding the pavement to build a clientele and to build a reputation. I don't want to talk mm -hmm. about any of those things. I want it to look easy and I want it to look magical mm -hmm. because that's what consumers want. They want to know that. They're, I'm not going to pick on anybody mm -hmm. by name. Yeah. I'm not going to use this person's yeah. name. But there's a person in our industry who is an educator who is pretty popular and they are famous for talking about their struggles, how hard it is to get up on stage and share with people and how emotionally draining it is to be in the public eye and how worn out they are after a hair mm. show. And I'll be honest with you, the public gobbles that mm. stuff up because it portrays this person as more mm -hmm, human. Mm -hmm. I get that and I understand that, but you're never going to see or hear as I want my public perception to be that I am super, that I'm above that, that I'm something. And I want people to go, I could be that way if I read the book, if I roll up my sleeves, if I work hard, if I'm mm. dedicated and committed, there's a, I could be like that a bit. And if I had a little bit, then I could get a lot. I want to come from that point of inspiration. I don't want you to look at me and go, oh, he's just like me. Mm. I want you to look at me and go, I want to you see the difference yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question and tell you, do I have crap? I have lots yeah. of crap. Am I going to tell people about it? No, you got your own right, crap. Right, right. Absolutely. That was incredible. That was a great answer. No, I get it. No, it's only because I'm speaking to you. I've spoke to a few different people. And I've seen that you're giving me like really different perspectives on things, which is very fun. Let me ask you a question. With all the education that you've done, have you ever considered opening up a school, opening up a barber school or attacking it that way? Because it seems like the goal is cut hair. I think I love this. Let me go to school, become a barber. Okay, now I'm a barber. I think I love this. Let me open up a shop. I love that. That's going good. Let me start apprenticing a few barbers. I've done that a few years. Oh, the next step is open up a barber school and go that route that you've ever thought about? Or what do you think about that? No, you know what? No, I'm at a different point. I want you to go online. I want you to go to Amazon. I want you to buy one of my books. I want you to read that book while I am fishing. Mm. <laughs> I look at guys like Tyreek and some other folks that own schools. I look at these guys and I go, these guys really work yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. Buy my next book. 
I worked hard for a lot of years. I still want to enjoy myself. When you see me at a hair show, I'm going to be teaching a class. I'm going to be on the floor. I'm going to be interacting with people. I'm going to be smiling. I'm going to be having mm -hmm. a good time. Okay. And then I'm going to go away. Then I'm going to be gone until the next mm. show. In the meantime, I'm writing books and I'm doing things, but I'm also right. enjoying my family and right. I'm fishing and I'm doing the other things that I like to do. I'm going to the gym and I'm riding my bike and I'm out in the fresh air and sunshine. You want to work hard. I get the message from me is you want to work hard, but you want to play as hard as you work. And I'm also at a point in my career, 35 years in, I'm closer to the end of my career than I am mm. the beginning in terms of where am I in my career cycle here. But I've tried to build a lot of things like my online store at ivansnute.com where I sell my books and my combs and things. And so I sell some stuff on Amazon and I sell my books on my website and on Amazon. A lot of those things are automated. A lot of those things are passive so that I can go do shows. And when I, as an example, when I go to Orlando, I go to Orlando, I do a three-day show in Orlando. And then my wife and I stay three more days in Orlando and have a mini vacation on the back right. end of it. I love it. I'm not, I'm not wrapping up a show, throwing everything in boxes and running home because I got the client in the morning. <laughs> it's funny because I'm live and, and it really feels, I, I listen to people like Denzel Washington as compared to some other actors that do TV shows. And Denzel will say, I don't do TV shows, right? I'm a movie and I do a movie and you watch me in a movie and you never see me on TV again. You never see me doing anything else. And then when my movie comes out, boom, I'm back. I'm out. I'm out in the fray. You see me. I'm on the red carpet. I'm here. And then I disappear. You never see me again. And that's like the old school way of doing it, where people would just present themselves for the moment, for a, an event, bring their best foot forward, but then also disappear and not give you too much of themselves. And that's how I see you as Denzel Washington of the barber industry. You know what? You could call me the Denzel Washington of the barber industry. I've been called the Michael Jordan of the barber industry. I will take any of those superstar yeah. comparisons that you wish no, to offer you. No, that, that's been awesome. Oh, so we talked about and some incurred for that. Just to wrap up here, what are some things they can expect? You wrote several books. Are you writing any new books? What are you working on now? What can they expect from you in the future? I got some really exciting stuff going on. I just introduced a brand new comb this week. Everybody knows the classic barber taper mm -hmm. comb yep. like this. It's been around for over a hundred years. You know anybody who has one in white? Something so simple, but so innovative. Mm. It's the same comb and love. It's the same mold, the same material. So I got a new comb. I got other new combs coming out. I got a new book I'm working on. That's coming out. I got a class. I'm super excited. I'm going to start sharing this class in the fall. I've been practicing it and guinea pigging it a little bit and getting it ready. The new class is called, you know that? Have you ever seen that farmer's insurance commercial with the guy where he says, we know some things because we've seen a few things? <laughs> yeah. You know that yeah, line? Yeah. Okay. I got the class coming out and this class is called 10 Things I Know For Sure About The Haircut mm. Business. Because I've seen a mm -hmm. few things. And I know a few things, and I'm not the smartest mm -hmm. guy out there, but there's a few things that I know for mm -hmm. sure I know that beauty and barber professionals mm. need to know. So that's a new class, 10 things I know for sure about the beauty and barber business. I'll be sharing it this fall premiere in San Antonio. I'll be sharing it at the Texas Barber Expo coming up in Corpus mm. Christi. I'll be sharing it at the Columbus premiere show coming up. I've got the one I got Jacksonville coming up. I've got NorCal Barber Expo, the Northern California Barber Expo coming up and a lot of big yeah. shows coming up the rest of this year. And I'm excited to share this class. So new book, new tools, new classes. What more and products? I got new products coming out. I got a my after buzz has been hot. This is advanced formula scalp care. I had a shade cream. The shade cream went away during COVID because one of the suppliers went out of business, but we have a new shave cream in the works. So I've got more liquid product coming to help people make money with some good products. There's a lot going on. Man, man. And we're, and you see the evolution. At what point did, okay, I'm ready to move from cutting hair to selling a product. I'm ready to move from selling product to doing education. What, like, how do you make those leaps from? Because I know that there's people who may end up watching this going, man, I want to do that, but I'm too big in a shop. Or I'm not as busy anymore. Am I ready for this next step? How did you know you were ready? Did you just... 
go at it and see if you could get How did I know I was ready? Forward. I think I was ready because I think I was ready because the kids moved from formula to Happy Meal and then they moved from like little gym shoes to Jordan and then they moved from public school to college and like this week my old and youngest son's getting married this week. Life is expensive, man. You got to make the register ring. You got to look at the opportunities available to you. You got to pick the opportunities that's right for you. Not everybody should be an educator. Not everybody should make product. Not everybody's going to invent the next amazing comb. Mm -hmm. You got to know you and you got to know what's in your wheelhouse. You also have to recognize that you might not know what you need to know to take something so common like this and do something as simple as I got to do it in white, but who's going to make it for me? Where am I going to buy it from? How much am I going to pay for it? How many am I going to order? When's it going to ship? If you don't know, you can learn right, how to right. do that stuff. I did the one time when I did it was the first time. And you asked about it. Sometimes when I did stuff, yeah, I screwed it up right, the right. first time. But I learned and I figured some stuff out. And then I came back and I did it again. This innovation, as simple as it is, Ivanduke.com, it's printed right there on the comb. You got to get a few of these. They're super cool, but it's not the first time that I looked at the comb category and said, how can I, where's the better mousetrap? How can I enhance or improve this? So yeah, and what, and I think out. another thing is that while you're doing that, while you're coming up with, okay, I think I want to do a comb. How do I do it? Where do I go? Where do I get it manufactured? All as you're having those concepts. What are you doing on the day to day? You're still pounding the pavement, going to the shop, still handing out business cards. And then when there's a, a gap in there, I'll watch a YouTube video. I'll do a little research on Google, but let me get back in the shop and let me continue working, continue building upon what you're doing. Cause I know a lot of people, they'll just stop. They'll go, oh, I want to start this project and let me now take a few months break and just go. Cause I got a hyper focus, but I love the opportunity showed up. And you just move. Do you feel like you work better from a place of that? What, when a new, uh, I don't know how to call it, or a new deficit in your life, that's when you're like, okay, what's the next thing? Or do you move? Do you just come? No, I think it works yeah, a little differently. I think that's, I got something on the front mm -hmm. burner. I got something on the back mm -hmm. burner. I got something on a roaring fire. I got something on a slow mm -hmm. simmer. I got something I'm mixing in the pot. And I got something on the shopping list for ingredients that I haven't started <laughs> yeah, cooking yet. Go, I think there's, and there's levels. And when you're cooking, all of a sudden you realize that's burning. I better deal with mm. that right now. I'm going to move that to the front burner. I'm going to take that off the flame. I'm going to put this on here. It's like a busy, many of your listeners at some point in their career before barbering, they worked in fast food or they worked in food service and things like that. We know what a crazy kitchen yeah. is like. I'm running a crazy mm. kitchen. I love it, dude. That's really good. Let me write that down in my notes. A crazy kitchen. That's good. And then you know, okay, I got to pay for college, so let me pull that off the back burner. Let's put it up front and see if it makes some revenue. And that's a good way to think. I try to teach my kids that is, is you may not, if like I poured that idea, like you may not have the money, but you may not know, like he said, my, my poor dad would say, I can't afford it. But my rich dad said, how can we afford it? which immediately opens up doors. Well, I never let money be the excuse for not doing something. The earth is covered in money. There's more money out there than you could ever imagine. You got to go get yeah. you some. And you got to find somebody who's got the money, who will give you the money, loan you the money, borrow the money, become a partner. And money is, there's also information. Ideas and information are out there. And you got to get the idea, the information, the money. You got to put all those pieces together. I tell people all the time, I can build you a $50,000 a year business in take home hair care product. Everybody in our industry talks about, I got to get a side gig. You don't need a side gig. What you need is what we call an inside gig. Inside your haircutting business is a gig that you're not playing. And that is product. If we get in the car, I don't know where you live, but wherever you live, if we get in the car and we go for a ride, if we visit 10 barber shops that are closest to your house. If we go to Google on our phone and we Google the 10 closest barbershops, I will bet you a chocolate frosted sprinkle donut. I will bet you a donut that nine out of 10 shops that we visit don't have any product for mm. sale. That is a billion dollar business that guys are choosing not to play in. I will tell you this, I can take anybody in our industry and I can build for them 
$50,000, a $1,000 a week business in take home hair care product and your investment to get started. Yeah, but I don't like it. But $20. I don't like it. It's awkward. $20. It's awkward. I don't want to sell products. Awkward is weird. What do I... You got, yeah. You know what? Then you know what? Then you need a spatula and a paper hat and you need to learn how to stay. Do you want prize with that? Because if you're not willing to do these things, yeah. you're out. Okay. I, I can, with one $20 bill, if you've got one $20 bill, you can build a business selling $1,000 a week in product and it will cost you nothing else. So if you don't have a 20, you borrow 20 from your cousin. And tell him, I'll give you 20 bucks back in a month. You got to loan me 20 for a month. Just $20. I can put you in the product business at a massive level. And on a practical, and on a practical level, because I hear that a lot. We're living in this age of that kids are growing up typing on their phones, communicate. That's how they communicate. So when they get a new customer and they're just happy to be able to cut their hair, they have, there's a level of like nervousness to be able to go to that first step and be like, Hey, this is the product I put in your hair do you think you may possibly want to buy? So what are some practical pointers you get over that introvert who doesn't want to sell? Here's the deal. We're coming up on the top of the hour yep. and we're going to need to say goodbye real fast, but I'm going to lead with this powerful idea. Somebody asked me recently, and this is what I said, and I'm going to say the same thing to you. They said, you got a young guy. He's coming right out of school. He's getting ready to get into the barber business. What is your number one piece of advice? for a new barber entering into the business, for them to be successful in the business. And this touches on everything we've talked about since we started talking almost 53 minutes ago. The one piece of advice that I have for beauty and barber professionals, graduate from school, and when you start your first job, the biggest piece of advice I have for you, here you go. Write it down in your notes, my friends. My number one piece of advice, lock your cell phone in the trunk of your car. Mm. Be present mm. with your eyes and your ears mm. and yourself. Show up and be there. Get your head out of your phone. Mm. Get your head out of your mm -hmm. ass. Be there. So good. I... And everything else will take yeah. care. Everything else will take care of it. Yeah, I hear you. That's what it is. They're so, fo so focused on other things. You overcompensate and you never. What about my yeah. Instagram? What about my Instagram? What about my booking app? What about my TikTok videos? None of it matters. Mm -hmm. Certainly not for the first six months right. in the business. Not any of it matters. Show up, fold the towels, sweep the floor, pick up the neck strips, put the razor blades in a sharp fin, Open your eyes, close your mouth, and pay attention. Amen. Thank you so much for your time.